Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a well-known local Frank Lloyd Wright house is donated to the famed architect school. And hear about ways to prevent the summer slide when students lose ground on learning during summer vacation. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Another federal appeals court this morning upheld a decision blocking President Trump's revised travel ban. The ruling came from a unanimous three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which ruled that the president violated U.S. immigration law by discriminating against people based on their nationality. The decision deals the Trump administration yet another legal defeat as the Supreme Court considers a separate case on the issue. Last Thursday marked the birthday to Frank Lloyd Wright, who was born 150 years ago. The famed architect got a big birthday present here in Phoenix, replete with a celebration that included the gifting of a house designed by Wright. Producer Mike Sauceda and videographer Juan Magana have the story. It's a style you may have seen before. The 1952 David and Gladys Wright House in the Arcadia section of Phoenix uses the same circular architectural motif as ASU's Gamage, and that home is circling back to the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture. The announcement was made by Aaron Betsky, the dean of the school, on what would have been Wright's 150th birthday with the house wrapped in balloons for the occasion. This house spiraling out of this beautiful neighborhood and reaching out to a place where you can look over at the mountains and over the whole valley will be a place that will be a living laboratory where graduate students and faculty will live and work together to figure out how we can make the Phoenix Valley better. The home was pledged to the school by the Rawling family, which bought the home in 2012 to save it from being demolished. We're extremely grateful and very enthusiastic about the future of the school and the house. And we believe very much in both the history of the school as the 85-year-old school that Franklin Wright founded, and we believe in the future under Aaron Betsky's leadership. And the idea of, of that creative community of the Talius and Fellowship, you know, making this a third home and welcoming the, the, the Phoenix community to participate in that, that spirit of, of creativity and fellowship gives the place a vitality and a meaning that's beyond anything we had hoped for when we began this in 2012. The donation is contingent on a new nonprofit raising $7 million by 2020 to restore and run the home, which will serve as a third location for the architectural school. It follows years of controversy over plans for commercial uses of the house by the Rawlings, plans that upset neighbors. Betsky says this pledge will help future students work on a problem we are very familiar with in the Phoenix area. The central problem that is facing architects in America and all across the world is the problem of sprawl. And Phoenix is in some ways ground zero for sprawl. Some people think that sprawl is going to go away. It isn't. It's all around us. It's not going to go away. We have to figure out how to do it better. Frank Lloyd Wright started figuring that out in 1934, and even before that, when he was working in the suburbs of Chicago, coming up with ideas how you could create better suburbs. Rawling says he will remain connected to the home. We'll be the, the biggest uh, supporters and cheerleaders for the school and all of its programming at Taliesin, Taliesin West, and the David Wright House. Besides serving as a school for future architects, the house will also host public tours. Here now with more is Victor City, the former dean of the School of Architecture at Taliesin and the current architect for preservation and planning at the David and Gladys Wright House. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. This house now, where, where is this located? Sure, it's uh, due south of Camelback Mountain in Arcadia, uh, just off Camelback Road. And it's now, it, the, the idea is to pledge this to the School of Architecture at Taliesin. That's correct. It's to uh, be of benefit to the School of Architecture. And how exactly is this going to be used by the school? Sure. So the, the School of Architecture is an 85-year-old uh, organization, um, has educated generations of architects. Um, the architecture philosophy at Taliesin is learning by doing. And so how can you better learn about preservation, for example, than uh, through hands-on learning? Uh, 
We intend to work directly with the, the students, the faculty, on uh, plans for the preservation of the house. Uh, we're looking to have uh, rotating opportunities for students and faculty and visiting scholars to, uh, to take up residence in this remarkable location. Why was the decision made to transfer operations of what is a home and turn it into a school? Sure. The, the home, I think, in the minds of many, is, is too valuable to lock up in, in the hands of one single resident. It's, uh, it's one of Wright's most remarkable late career uh, houses. It's, it's a really an experimental project. Wright, because it was designed for his son, was able to take uh, latitude on the design and, and experimentation with material that he really wouldn't have with other clients. And so he, he goes uh, to greater lengths on the experimentation side with that house. He uses a, a wonderful round geometry that then was uh, seen, for example, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses concrete blocks in an experimental way, learning about the the, the unique uh, forms, uh, concrete forms for those blocks. This type of experimentation is, the, is going to be underlying the, the relationship between the School of Architecture and the house. It's that type of experimentation for our students and faculty that, that we really want to see furthered. Now, the donation is contingent on fundraising, $7 million endowment by the end of 2020. Um, what is that all about? Sure. Some of it is uh, to go directly to the uh, preservation and restoration of the house itself. Uh, we're also very excited about plans to uh, restore uh, a number of uh, citrus trees uh, on the property. As you likely know, Arcadia was known for many, many years as, as the place where citrus uh, was, was grown in, in Phoenix. And, um, and to bring that, that feeling back of uh, being able to uh, start out within the grove of the trees and then rise up in this lovely spiral gesture over the tops of the, the trees and see the landscapes all around you, uh, th those I I ideas would, would also contribute uh, to the, the restoration. We're, we're also looking at a, a substantial amount of that uh, $7 million base amount as being, as going towards the, directly towards the School of Architecture as an endowment. Okay, I, I, know, so I was wondering though, um, I know the money was supposed to be used to restore and run the site. As mm -hmm. far as restoration cons is concerned, what kind of condition is this house in? It's in remarkably good condition for a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Uh, he, his works are often plagued by, say, roof leaks or, or foundation issues. Not here. Uh, here, the roof, uh, which was built in 1952, it has very, very few uh, leaks. We're, we're looking more at uh, restoring some of the concrete slabs, for example. Uh, some of the masonry has deteriorated around mm. the base. Um, and in uh, some of the woodwork. We're, we're looking to bring this back to a, not necessarily a perfect condition, but to a, a place, a, a type of condition where all of the deteriorated uh, fabric of the house is, 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 is knitted back uh, together into the, into the project. Now again, students, faculty, they will live there, work there, learn there? I mean, will they actually reside in the house? On a rotating basis, based on uh, kind of meeting certain criteria, we are. This is a school of architecture that's for graduate students. These are students who come from all over the world. Um, th this is. Uh, these are not undergraduate students that are <laughs> inclined to do anything except for uh, taking in the the architecture in in a remarkable way. You, you know, Franklin Wright uh, very specifically talked about architecture that was living. Uh, so it was meant to be lived in, not necessarily preserved in amber and and only experienced behind you know, velvet ropes. This is a, an architecture that, that needs to be experienced. You need to feel the breezes. You need to, to hear the, 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 the birds through the open windows. This is uh, an architecture that is about the human condition. Now, and, and again, there will be public tours, correct? The idea is to, um, once the, uh, the, the donation to the school, uh, to benefit the school is complete, uh, tours will be, we're, we're considering that. We're, we're not uh, sure about the timing on that and, and certainly won't be doing any public tours until we go through the standard process with the City of Phoenix, which will include neighborhood input and, and uh, input from the Planning and Historic Preservation Committees. As far as other public events, I mean, what, what's, what's uh, you know, planned or thought of or proposed, at least, for now? 
the School of Architecture will um, use the, the campus uh, as it sees uh, fit for educational purposes in, in, the, in the, the coming uh, months and, and years. And, and so that might include uh, lectures for an invited public. Uh, the, the idea is to find ways to elevate the, the discourse about architecture in this city. Okay, so with that in mind, reaction from the neighbors. We anticipate that the neighbors will be pleased that the future direction of the house is for culture, education, um, as opposed to any uh, of their worst fears, which in the past had included uh, some element of commercialization. This is explicitly not that. It's, it's explicitly for the, the benefit of future generations of architects. But what, what are you hearing? Well, we have opened a good line of communication with the, the neighbors through some of their representatives, and we really do hope to, to expand that uh, moving forward. Uh, this is, again, about the city of Phoenix and, and other neighborhoods, um, and, and, but those living around it yes. are, are going to be impacted, obviously. The obviously, most. yeah, so, so I, I'm just kind of curious because it was such a fight beforehand. Exactly. I mean, is, 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 is the, has the tenor of the conversation been lowered, or you just haven't heard anything quite yet? We, we feel that having had a better uh, interaction, uh, at least we're listening, and we've been listening over the past uh, six or seven months to the neighbors. That has helped a lot. I, I think it's allayed the worst fears, and I think more importantly, our planning for the future is going to take some of the concerns of the neighbors in, into uh, consideration. Reaction from the city? We believe it's been quite positive. Uh, certainly the, the mayor and some of the, the, the council members have, have been very positive. I, I think we, we view it as a, a way out of the impasse that the house has been um, in for the, the, the past couple of years. So, so okay. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a path forward that I think is, is probably the most uh, viable of, of many. And it's also, I think, a, a substantial act of generosity. It's, it's certainly going to be the largest gift to the school in its 85-year history and uh, as well one of the larger philanthropic gifts in this city. So timeline for all of this. Obviously, the $7 million needed by 2020. What other benchmarks are out there? We are looking at uh, really upwards of 15 million to, to do the project right. Seven million will, will pull the trigger on the, the transfer of the house uh, to uh, the, the, the foundation that will support the school. And, uh, but, but we're gonna start with some initial, uh, very much needed preservation uh, as soon as possible. Right. Once we work with the, the preservation staff to, at the city to, to make that happen. So the renovation begins uh, now. In a, in a small way uh, for, for the most critical uh, elements of the project, yes. All right, good yeah. to see you. Thanks for joining us, Thank we appreciate you. it. You bet. This is Arizona Horizon. Up next, we'll talk about the summer slide.
The circus is mostly associated with entertainment, but education experts say that circus skills are deeply rooted in math and science. And as a result, circus schools are a great place for young kids to learn in a fun environment. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Rob McJanet take us inside a circus camp in Scottsdale that's clowning around with a purpose. How do we want to warm our bodies? Running. Today we'll go this way. Ready? Run, run, run. Twisting. One, two. Stretching. Up. And over, OVA over. Circus camp is in session. Why don't we grab some juggling scarves? Instructor Brian Foley is a clown. Did you know that the more you juggle, the faster you will be able to read and the more you will remember what you read? Foley has spent most of his life as a clown with theater companies. Okay. But after graduating from NYU and ASU, I said good job. He now spends his days teaching circus skills to kids like Simone McKay. Well, we were looking at camps and we found the website for circus camp and I looked at it and I noticed the viewers like they were different things like silks and trapeze, and it sounded very fun, so I decided to go. So you guys remember what we did last time? Circus camp is the brainchild of Rachel Stegman. When I uh, was growing up here in Arizona, um, I didn't really have anything that really grabbed me that I was really passionate about. A lot of kids had all kinds of sports and dance and ice skating, whatever. I tried a whole bunch of things, nothing just clicked until I found circus. Rachel discovered the circus when she was eight years old and she could never get it out of her head. For her, circus has always been about more than just performing. It's been very therapeutic. It's um, something that has brought up my mood from suffering in the past from depression. So um, without circus, I don't know where I'd be. So it has basically saved my life. Hands a little bit lower. Rachel opened the Circus School of Arizona in 2007. Good. Circus Again, Summer Camp is a way for kids to learn new down. skills, but also combat down. summer learning loss. Now we're going to try it up here. Summer learning loss is when a child loses a significant portion of material learned during the school year. Remember, you're not holding me. I will hold you. The amount varies among grades and socioeconomic levels. There you go. But most experts estimate kids lose about two months' worth of math skills during the summer. That's it, that's it. Forcing teachers to reteach these skills in the fall. Good job! With circus camp, kids learn physical feats, but also gain STEM knowledge. There is so much science, math, technology, engineering involved in the circus, both in, in the apparatus and what you do with the apparatus and the body positions and the motions and all that, but also even in down to the rigging. Rachel and the other instructors use physics and geometry terms to help the students understand arm and leg placement. Oh, jump mountain. Simone is just 10 years old and obviously hasn't taken geometry in school, but now has gained an understanding of angles. That's it. You have to put your knee at a certain, certain angle, like a 90 degree angle, or you have to decide whether you want your knees to be an obtuse or an acute angle when you're doing a particular um, trick on the trapeze with the other people. Rachel says circus skills also help kids who may learn differently. I had a real hard time not because of not being smart or intellectual but I'm also you know have problems with ADD and all those kinds of things and I was a more hands-on learner and had a real hard time just sitting and um, I always, the only way that I would really learn things is by doing it. The instructors focus not only on the physical and cognitive skills, but on building self-confidence in the campers. High five, that was <laughs> awesome. Which can contribute to better performances in all aspects of life. Ready, Yes, there you go. I think it's empowering and people feel, uh, they, you know, they feel like they're doing things that are gravity defying, um, seem, they seem to be humanly not possible. It feels good on the quad trapeze when we do when we did this particular trick. I would watch myself in the mirror as we spun around, and I felt like an Olympic trapeze artist. If you're interested in circus camp, visit circusschoolofarizona.com. Programs like the circus camp help children keep learning during the summer. Here to tell us more about ways to avoid the summer slide, a time when kids tend to lose ground in learning, is Don Gerundo, Director of Education and Children at Valley of the Sun United Way, and Kathy Husser, Deputy Community Services Director for the Tempe Public Library. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for joining so us. This, this summer slide, summer learning laws, how... I mean, how much 
Do kids, I mean, a kid could lose an awful lot there if you're not paying attention, huh? They sure can. They can lose up to two months of math and reading skills over the summertime. It's that time when families are just not active in engaging children, exercising those minds. Is, is, is there something, is, is reading more than math, more than other? What, what aspects seem to take the biggest hit, do you think? I think that it can balance out. It depends on the individual child, that's for sure. Right. And so if families can find activities that stimulate their children, they can engage in utilizing their minds to be able to maintain that learning that they have had over the school year. And of course, at the library, I would imagine reading is a big deal. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. I mean, like Don had mentioned, one to two months of learning is lost in math and in reading skills. And uh, a couple years ago, Dominican University published a study that basically said that um, participants or children that participated in a public library reading program uh, developed not only sustainable learning and reading throughout the summer, but achieved higher uh, reading skills and reading test scores when they went back to school. They were more confident, they enjoyed reading, and they also read above their grade level and also loved reading. So it's all about making it fun and making it more engaging throughout the summer. So how do you choose uh, a best book for summer reading? You know what? It's what do you like to read? Um, do you like to read mysteries? Do you like to read nonfiction? Do you like to cook? You could read a recipe. You could check out a cookbook. You could, um, there's so many things that you can do to, to read, to help with your math skills. I know the Tempe Public Library specifically targets um, reading development through a Reading Sprouts program and also, and also Math Sprouts program for those underachievers. They've not quite reached where they need to be. Uh, in their grade level, and so we give them extra help over the summer. So it's what you like to read and what you want to do. And I would imagine with reading, with any of these things that you want to stay active with over the summer, you got to make sure it's challenging, but not so much. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's got to be easy, but not too much. I mean, you got to find that magic middle, exactly. don't you? Exactly. And engaging in some of our what we call summer programming, like the Boys and the Girls Club and the YMCA, finding programs that have literacy and math embedded into them so that it's fun while learning, so it's exciting, so they don't feel like they're being drilled or sitting in the classroom is very important. Yeah, because they get enough of that during the winter and fall and spring. Exactly. <laughs> you have a, a bag of stuff here. What's, what's going I on? I do. With this? So these are uh, Valley of the Sun United Way school readiness kits, and these are designed primarily primarily for children three to five to prepare them for kindergarten. They're full of home activities for families to do so they don't have to go out and purchase other items, but they can do fun, exciting things with their children. What we often hear from families is they want to go back and do some of those activities with their children when they're transitioning from kindergarten to first grade. Right. So you can kind of make that adaptation. And you have like crayons and other stuff in we there do. as well. We do. We have crayons. We have three bilingual books. The whole school readiness kit is bilingual. So that way if a family is maybe having to stay with a family member that doesn't speak the family's language, they have the ability to be able to do that as well. Um, what about those who say it's summer, kids need to decompress. They get enough of the ABCs and the whatevers during the, you know, the rest of the year. Let them go have some fun during the summer. They can have fun. They can have fun in the valley and they can stay inside and still be cool. There's a lot of things you can do to help with literacy and math and still be cool and have fun. For example, you can visit a museum, the Tempe History Museum. You can visit the Phoenix Art Museum with a su uh, summer culture pass program. Uh, there are many Valley libraries that participate in this free program where you have a library card, check out a, a culture pass and you get two free admissions. Um, there's programming for adults, there's uh, programming for children. Uh, totally Tempe Tuesdays have uh, family programs every Tuesday from two to four. So there's many, many things. There's rec uh, recreational centers that at the Kiwanis uh, Center that provides a lot of fun activities with that uh, literacy base as well. Yes, yes. So there's many, many things out there. As far as technology, science, math, these sorts of skills, uh, what's out there for these kids? There's multiple different programs that are available for children. They can access different programs and have access to computers at their libraries. A lot of our families don't always have the ability to go online at home, but visiting the library is a great thing. As well as we would add that there's the summer meal program, so children could engage in summer meals and then have the opportunity to be at a school and be able to maybe visit the library or use the computer lab and things like that. I was going to ask you about that. We have kids that depend on free and reduced meals during the school year. What happens over the summer? Well, there are plenty of sites throughout the valley at the libraries, sometimes at the swimming pools, at the schools that serve a free hot and um, 
lunch and breakfast for children. And then they also have to provide activities for children. And the key is, is they also get some socialization. A lot of our children end up staying home. In Arizona, it's very hot, so they don't leave the house. By getting the children to go out and get that nice, nutritious meal, mm -hmm. engage in some activities and have some socialization, you're going to ensure that they're ready when school comes back. And again, Tempe Library has this sort of activity going on? Absolutely. Um, the Tempe Public School District has a summer lunch bunnies, a summer lunch buddies at six of our schools. And the Tempe Public Library also participates in Maricopa County Reads, which is the summer reading program. So you don't need a library card to sign up for the summer reading program, but we want you to come in and visit anyway. But definitely sign up for the reading program. You, you mentioned the heat. I would imagine just getting around in the summertime to these sorts of things is, is a big deal. It is, but there are lots of uh, transportation. There's the bus, the orbit. Um, we also have activities at our community outreach centers, so that can be also close to the neighborhood as well. So no excuse for the summer there slide. There is not. And they can read online and log their books for the summer reading program as well. Well, there you go. So Good. no excuse. Kids and online, there you go. Good to have you both here. Thank Thanks you for so joining much. us. So much. Okay. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon. And we'll hear from attorney Tim Hogan, who is retiring after decades of fighting for education funding and other efforts in Arizona. Tim Hogan from the Center for Law and the Public Interest, Tuesday, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Antiques Roadshow is discovering treasures in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I'm speechless. I've been sitting in the 